his office when he was here on the earth as the Messiah. And we jump back to Psalm 22, and of course, now I'm just going way off my notes, but Psalm 22. And we get to verses like... Yeah, absolutely. We can start with the very first verse, verse bro. Yeah. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Sound familiar? Yeah. And then we can go right on down. Why art thou so far from helping me from the words of my roaring? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season... And not silent. But thou art holy, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and they were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh to my scorn, and they shoot out the lip, and they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Sound a lot almost like the words of Jesus Christ of the ones that were mocking him on the cross. Many bulls have been past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around, those that mocked him came against him. They gape upon me with their mouth as they raped me and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. What happened to that crucifixion that made it so excruciating? The bones got popped out of joint to make them up. Get in those positions sometimes. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shard, and my tongue cleaveth cleave to my jaw. Why would they offer up something for him to drink? Because he was out there dying. He was thirsty. They offered him gall and bitter uh, vinegar. For dogs have been past me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Once again, sound familiar? They nailed the hands and the feet of Jesus. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. So, once again, does this sound familiar when it comes to the Easter account? They gamble to cast lots for the garments of Jesus Christ. <laughs> but be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength, hast thee, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword and my darling from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth, and from thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. So when we look at Psalm 22, it is actually the oldest crucifixion account. I think if I remember correctly, this was written uh, 400 years before crucifixion was even invented. Here we have the psalmist David not only describing the crucifixion of a man, but describing the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. If we go to Psalm 23, as we've already said, that is uh, the psalmist David, prophetically speaking, of Jesus Christ and his office as priest. That is the office that he holds right now in heaven. He is our high priest who has sat down at the right hand of the Father. We heard the pastor talk about this, I believe it was on Sunday night. And then finally, if we would get into the prophetic study, which we're just passing over quickly, uh, for the sake of bringing it out, Psalm 24, the office of Jesus Christ as king. Not right now, but when he comes back, we know after the tribulation, he's going to sit down on his throne, on the throne of his father, David, and rule from Jerusalem. Um, we've talked about there, and just passing, lift up your heads, O ye gates, and lift ye up uh, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. That's literally talking about the gates of Jerusalem, the city itself. So it is prophetic of Jesus Christ in his office of king. 
In order to prove, in order to prove, in order to prove the, re the death and resurrection of Christ, we need to study the prophecies concerning the office of Christ as a prophet. Why is that important? Because the odds of one man fulfilling all the prophecies in the Old Testament alone are miraculous. I can't remember, I'm just pulling this off the top of my head right now, but Peter Stoner, um, we, you'll hear many ministers use him in passing when it comes to um, prophecy and the fulfillment of it, but he put the likelihood of Jesus Christ fulfilling eight of those prophecies in the Old Testament was like taking a man, covering the state of Texas in quarters, taking a man, blindfolding him, marking a single coin, stirring up all those coins, and sending that man who's blindfolded loose. And the odds of him finding that one mark quarter, of all quarters covering the state of Texas, if I remember correctly, three feet deep yet, were the odds of just eight of the, of, were the odds of Jesus Christ fulfilling just eight of those prophecies. So when we look at prophecies, not something to take lightly, but when we look at the fact that Jesus Christ fulfilled them, we can rejoice even more knowing that our preaching is not vain. But when we look at the Old Testament, we have many, many prophecies concerning uh, the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. If someone would please find Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9, Psalm 41, 9. And someone else find John chapter 13 and verse 21. John 13, 21. Whoever has Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9, go ahead and read that. Yea, my own familiar friend, and whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lived up this evil against me. My friend, which I did trust, lifted up his heel against me. When we look at the Word of God, in Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9, we already see it being prophesied that the Messiah is going to be betrayed by one of his own friends. Now, prophecy is one thing, but the fulfillment is another. So do we have fulfillment that Jesus Christ was, was betrayed by one of his friends? What, was, what does John chapter 13 and verse 21 state? Jesus had thus said, He was troubled in spirit, and testified, and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall be betrayed. That one of you shall be betrayed. And when you look at this account, what do you think is going on in John chapter 21? Or John chapter 13? It's a night that we're all familiar with when it comes to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Last Supper. And all the disciples were gathered there. And Jesus Christ tells them outright, Tonight, one of you are going, is going to betray him. Did Judas already know that he was going to betray Christ that night? Or was it something that just happened on the way? We all know that Judas already had it in his heart to betray Christ. He already had it planned that that night he was going to be betrayed, that he was going to betray Christ. And he sold him out. And Jesus knew it. Can you imagine being in the shoes of Jesus Christ, knowing that someone was going to betray you, someone that you knew and took that was close to you, someone that you tried to train and help in the ministry, someone that you taught the things of God, Jesus said, tonight, one of you is going to be betraying me. And we all know the rest of the count. As they're there having the Passover supper, Jesus dips the salt and hands it to Judas and says, whatsoever you do, do quickly. Jesus knew who was going to betray him, and he knew he was going to be betrayed that night. And we all know this from studying the crucifixion account. But when we go back all the way to Psalm chapter 41 and verse 9. It was already predicted. Not that because it was written in Psalm chapter 51 or in prophecy that it had to happen. 
And, G and God went through all this painstaking detail to make sure that it happened. That's not what happened. In prophecy, God and his foresight document what's going to happen. God does not make anybody do anything. That would be a violation of free will. But the Holy Ghost, years and years, centuries before Jews betrayed Christ, wrote in prophecy that there was going to be a friend that would betray the Messiah. And not, and he goes into more detail. What does Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 12 state? Zechariah 11 and 12. And someone else find Matthew 26, 15, and then also 27, 3. Zechariah, Zechariah 11, 12. And someone else get Matthew 26 and 15 and 27, 3. So in, here in prophecy in Zechariah, we have him prophesying that the Messiah is going to be sold for 30 pieces of silver. What actually happens in Matthew chapter 27, I'm sorry, Matthew 26, 15, and also 27 verse 3. So Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And before this account even happened, we have the prophet Zechariah documenting that the Messiah is going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. When we look at prophecy here, it's not obscure. We know exactly what we're looking at. And it is in detail what's going to happen. Zechariah didn't say that he's going to be betrayed for 25 pieces of silver and then the high priest gave him 30, but we have the exact amount. The Holy Ghost knew what was going to happen, and years before it happened, started prophesying that the Messiah was not only going to be betrayed by a friend, but for 30 pieces of silver. And what's going to happen to that silver? Well, Zechariah tells us that too. If someone would read verse 13 of Zechariah 11. So, Brother Peter, maybe you just write in Zechariah 11 and verse 12 that the Messiah is going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And we don't have to go far. We go to the exact next verse, and God tells us what's going to happen to that 30 pieces of silver. It's not like we're jumping to somewhere else in the Old Testament. It's right there. He's going to be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver, and it's going to be used to purchase a potter's field. What does Matthew chapter 27, verses 5 through 7 say? So we see here that the Old Testament is nothing but documenting what's going to happen to the Messiah in prophecy. We have proof through the Word of God that what actually happened to Jesus Christ is the truth. And because of that, he truly was the Messiah. If we go farther, we can look at the demeanor of Jesus Christ. We find in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7. Isaiah 53 is also the other famous account when it comes to the Messiah and the crucifixion. What does Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 7 state? And someone else find Matthew 27 and verse 12. Brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before the shearers is 
So he openeth not his mouth. So he openeth not his mouth. He was silent before the accusers. He didn't say anything to try to defend himself. What does Matthew chapter 27, verse 12 say? And when he was accused of the chief priests and elders, the answer not answered nothing. And when these accusate, when the accusations were brought against him, once again, we have the Messiah fulfilling prophecy in the fact that he did not open his mouth. He was silent before his accusers. Psalm chapter 22, verse 16. Brother, are you still in Zechariah? Yep. You want to get Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 for me? Um, who read Isaiah 53? Did you read it? Okay, that's fine. Uh, brother, if you could get Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. Someone else get Psalm 22, 16. Someone else get Luke 23, 33. I'll get Mark. Brother, you want to go ahead and read Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, please? Now, for upon the house of David, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace, and of supplication, and of supplications, and they shall look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. So they shall look upon him, whom they have pierced. They're going to treat him as a thief, as a no good citizen of the country. What does Psalm 22 and verse 16 state? For the dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and pierced my feet. They pierced my hands, they pierced my feet. Once again, they're treating him as a criminal. Does someone have Luke chapter 23 and verse 33? So they crucified him among the thieves, or the malefactors. In Mark chapter 15, verses 27 and 28. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And just to go on with some of the other verses we were reading. And they that pass by rail on him, wagging their heads and saying, All thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. So he was treated as a criminal. We see that described in prophecy in several different locations, even in locations we did not read, including, including Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5 and 12. And if we go back to, and for the sake of time and everything, we've just read it. What did we read over and over that they did to him? What did they physically do to him in the passages we just read? We can almost reach out and touch it. They pierced his hands and they pierced his feet. We know that they did that according to Luke chapter 24, 39 and 40. If someone would please read that. Luke 24, 39 and 40. Behold my hands and my feet, that is I myself, handle me to see. For spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed him his hands and his feet. So we read in the Old Testament that they are going to pierce his hands and they're going to pierce his feet. And we wanted to read the crucifixion account, I'm sure that we'd also find that they pierced their hands and pierced his feet. But here we have a primary witness, Jesus Christ himself saying, Behold my hands and behold my feet, which they pierced. And this is not going to be the only time in time itself that Jesus is going to say this because we know that there's going to come a day, according to Zechariah, at the end of the tribulation period, 
when they're going to look upon him whom they pierced and say, where did you get those scars? And he's going to say, I got these in the house of my friends. So they pierce his hands, they pierce his feet. This is documented in prophecy and document and fulfilled. We see in the New Testament. What does Psalm chapter 34 and verse 20 state? Psalm 34, 20. And someone else also find John chapter 19, 33 through 36. John 19, 33 through 36. Psalm 34, 20. He keepeth all of his bones, not one of them is broken. What do we find recorded in the book of Luke? I'm sorry, John, chapter 19, verses 33 to 36. When they finished Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break on his legs. But when the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, a four came out, came there out blood and water. And he that saw it their record, and his record is true, and he knows that he saith true, that he might believe. So here we find that John is recording the words of Psalm chapter 34, verse 20. And he's saying outright that this is the fulfillment. Is it coincidence that this is the fulfillment and that one person was just going on? Why did the Romans break the legs of the other men but not Jesus? So let me ask you this. Why were the legs of the men broken on the other crosses but not Jesus? Because he was dead already. And why did they break the legs? Well, they were trying to speed up the crucifixion process because it was raining, it was dark, and they were trying to get it over with. And Romans were experts when it came to death. They knew when somebody was dead. And they had to be. Because if a Roman centurion or a Roman guard was on duty guarding an individual and they got away, guess what? They got whatever penalty that person was to receive, which means if that person's penalty was death, they were going to get that penalty. That's why when we look at the book of Acts in verse 16, we find the jailer about ready to commit suicide because he was responsible for all those men in the dungeon and had the Romans beaten them to what got them alive, he would have to carry out the sentence of every one of those individuals. And that's why we hear Paul crying out, don't do it, we're all here. But just to be saved, they pierced his heart to make sure that he was dead. And we find that that was a part of prophecy as well. Do you still have Zechariah 12, brother? Sorry, I'm not trying to. I know we've already read it once, but while you're looking for that, someone else read Psalm 22, 16, and 18. Psalm 22, 16, and 18. And if you get Zechariah 12, 10, just go ahead and read it from it. Look at Psalm 22, what? Verses 16 and 17. For the dogs have compassed me, and the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, and the, they pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. And what does Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10 state? No, for all the hell of Satan, and for me, that was the first one, the spirit of grace and of supplication. They shall look upon me when they have tears, and they shall mourn for him, as one mourns for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for his poor him, as one that is in bitterness for his first one. So we know that they pierced the Messiah. They pierced his hands and feet, they pierced his side. And we know that Christ's body was not going to suffer decay like everybody else's throughout history. We find that in Psalm chapter 16 and verse 10. And really, we don't have to go to verses for this. I should have put them down anyhow, but what does Psalm chapter 16 and verse 10 state? For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou, thou suffer. Thy holy one to see corruption. 
So the Holy One is, of course, the Messiah, and thou wilt not suffer him to see corruption. If we look at the, the body of Jesus Christ, how many days was he in the tomb? Three. Did, he get, did his body have time to return to the dust? Did it have time to decay? No. No. When we go back to the account of Lazarus, he was dead for several days. And their concern wasn't that his body is decayed and his ear might be left behind, but man, he stings. We don't want him out here. So when we look at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God said that his body would not see decay. We have that in prophecy. Psalm 1610. And we know that his body was not in the tomb long enough to experience decay. So today we've looked at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different prophecies concerning the death, resurrection, and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We've already said in the opening that according to Peter Stoner, the fulfillment of just eight prophecies of the Old Testament, Old Testament the Old Testament being fulfilled in one man is equivalent to taking the state of Texas covering in quarters three feet deep, marking one single quarter, stirring it up, blindfolding a man, setting him loose, <coughs> and the odds of that man finding that one quarter are the exact same odds we have of just eight prophecies being fulfilled in one man. And when we look at the life of Jesus Christ, aside from just the crucifixion and resurrection, he fulfilled many, many more prophecies than that. So when we look at the Word of God, prophecy dictates that the only conclusion is that Jesus Christ was exactly who he said he was. He was the Messiah. He did die, but he rose again the third day. And because he rose again the third day, according to the Apostle Paul, our preaching is not in vain. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to add at this point? In one of the upcoming lessons, I have every intention on looking and studying the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ from a historical aspect. Is there any way that we can prove through history, through what they call extra biblical books, history books, or anything looking at it from a historical perspective, that Jesus was who he said he was? We are going to bow our heads in prayer, and we are going to prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be plowed, that they be good soil, for your word to follow on, that we may remember throughout the week. But even greater than that, that we may apply it to our lives. Lord, that we may even be transformed to the very image of Jesus Christ even farther. Anoint the song leader and the musicians as they lead us in songs you have us to sing, as they praise you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. Anoint the pastor's mind and his lips as he brings forth your words today, Lord. Give him a special blessing as well. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you.